Good morning. Please turn with me to Psalm 105 as we look at the subject this morning. Continually, continually, a word that honestly comes out of the first few verses. My brother's translation was a little bit different, but in the ESV beginning in verse 1, it reads, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually, the ESV will say. That's going up to verse 4. Now rereading the word that was well read by our brother. That was a little bit redundant, but I just wanted to emphasize two things. Two things we'll emphasize during the lesson. That is the whole concept of seeking and seeking continually. And why is that important? Well, in this chapter, it's pretty lengthy. If we're going to get out here in a reasonable amount of time, I'm going to have to cut it down. And I'm going to have to cut it down to some themes that I saw. And those themes had to do with this whole concept, really, of a subtitle you might see on your study guide. And it's things unsaid. Things unsaid. Because as I was starting to think of a way to organize thoughts in this passage, I thought of really people started to stand out to me. There are a number of people. He's going to talk about Abraham, one of the patriarchs. His son Isaac, going on through Jacob, uh, really uh, Joseph, sorry, forgot one, and Moses. And ultimately what we see in these people are some things he's going to specifically state about their uh, walk, the things that it cost them to actually get the people of Israel, something that mattered. But ultimately, the things that are going to seem to be more important are the things that are unstated in this passage. And the first thing to notice in our lives, when he is talking about, okay, in that verse where he says, verse 5, remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and his judgments. It's one thing for me to just look through this psalm and look through it like what you uh, probably know is the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. You can get a whole bunch of names in looking at that. But when we started, I started talking about the whole concept of foundation. And there's a certain point you reach in the Old Testament where it seems that the Psalms, where we are right now, they are a hyperlink to give us more in-depth understanding of really what was going on through this, I'm sorry, this place where we're getting the history of the kings and really uh, a kind of short description. But now it's going to be inverted because now what we see in the Psalms is really going to be filled out with what you've seen in the lives of these people. Uh, if you go back and study what, what they went through in, in Genesis. If you, if you look at Abraham, he's going to start out with verse 6. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord. Our God, his judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant for ever and the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. You don't see a whole lot about Abraham. there. He's going to go and talk about in verse nine, the covenant he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac. See, but if you understand the things that are unstated about the life of Abraham, as he goes on toward the end of the passage to talk about all the great things that that promise made for Abraham, you're not going to hear certain things uh, such as uh, the kind of drama that Abraham went through when he heard certain things. But then he had to go back to his family who didn't necessarily hear what he heard. And if you've ever been in a situation where you've been the middleman, the person carrying the message, then you sometimes understand the pressure of having to bring eh, news, right? I mean, the news is great. It's awesome. So I'm guessing when Abraham first brought that news, oh, we're going to have a kid? That's great. But as the waiting set in, then the middleman starts to look more and more, oh, wait, ridiculous. And so you know the story of how that wait played itself out. And so, okay, I would have been fine if you just left me alone. I'm about to check out. No kids. That's cool. But now you're giving me hope again, Abraham <laughs> and Mrs. Abraham, Sarah, right? And so now the wanting starts all over again. And is Mrs. Abraham Hearing from God, like you, you checked your phone and you got a new met. No, that's going to create a little tension between Sarah and Abraham, Abraham being the middleman. See, so those are the things that are unsaid about this great promise. See, because there's a thing that says hope deferred can make the heart, oh, so sick. And so the thing that they're going through is the real life um, situation of having great aspirations, great ambitions, or have, and having to wait on them. And you know how the story goes, and then trying to help God out, how'd that work out? Oh, 
So now you got, we talk about to this day, people are talking about, oh, praise God that we are in a place where we don't have to worry about the things that they're worrying about in the Middle East. But understand that what we're saying today in the Middle East goes back to the pressure that that family was under in waiting for that promise. And so the consequences of the mistakes we can make when we're called to wait in a situation where everybody's like, are you sure you heard what you heard? We talk about it, call it gaslighting now. There are certain situations where we don't have to have anybody gaslight us. Life will cause us to gaslight ourselves. Did I really hear that right? I don't know. Okay, well, maybe Hagar is a good option. Hagar's a bad option, but right? <laughs> but when you start to second guess yourself, then Hagar starts to look more and more rational. And that's what Abraham's actually going through. See, that's what's unsaid in Psalm 105. But in order to get the most out of the passage, it's going to require you to do a little bit more than simply, oh, reading. Because when you go, you're like me, I, I confess. There are times I told you last week, I was blanking out in the front row when I was trying to think too much during the communion, right? There are times I look at these passages, I'm like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> skip ahead. But, but I've learned over time, right? <laughs> Maybe give God a chance to work and simply remind me that if I'm at my best, I'm not the one making this up anyway. Of course, I'm making mistakes. It's coming through my mouth. But God willing, he is the author, like our brother said, and the finisher of not only our faith, but if we are genuinely speaking as the oracles of God, those blank spots when I've got the writer's block are reminding me where, if it's right, where it's coming from in the first place. And so understand in those times when you look at a passage like this, understand that sometimes it requires us to go deeper into the story if we're really going to get the most out of a chapter like a Psalm 105. It's just giving us names and relying on us, like he said in verse 5, remember the wondrous works. See, he's just naming the works here, but he's requiring us to go deeper in our understanding, our desire to, as we talked about, continually, continually seek God so that we deepen our understanding to the point where these stories have practical value for the things you're struggling with while you are waiting. And you're tempted to pick Hagar when Sarah is enough, right? Right? And so ultimately, if you keep moving on, he will continue to say, it's not just Jacob, or sorry, it's not just Abraham and Jacob that have problems, sorry, had problems. We're going to talk a little bit about Jacob after we get to verse 9 and 10, where he says, the covenant he made with Abraham, his sworn pro uh, promise to Isaac. How do you think that waiting affected Isaac? Huh? It cost Isaac nothing? It cost Isaac at least a little bit. I mean, from the very beginning, how do you think your relationship with dad's going to work out if... That's throwing you up on the altar. We got this. I'm sorry. <laughs> and you see, we just assume that, oh, they just moved on past that. Our brother's talking about how much of a joy it is to have his son up here with him. It's a joy to see. <laughs> but understand there are some things that Isaac had to get over in the trust that might have seemed to have been broken when his dad put him up on the altar and he knew what was going on. This doesn't portray him as being a young man who was unaware. So sometimes the things that are unsaid are, oh, they just moved on and it was just a happy family. No, they might have had to go through some things to get the peace and the trust and the respect back. Right? Because dad's already made the, well, he didn't know about the, the mistake with Hagar, but he knows about the results, right? You ever think that came up and now he's putting me on the altar and thank God I'm still alive, but good, no, I don't want to go out with him anymore. <laughs> those are the real unsaid things that they have to get through in order to get their relationship back right and going on Jacob Jacob where it says which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant understand some of the unstated things that I'm going to have to get through in my walk with God or my walk in life are going to have to be this word of wisdom I heard from somebody not too long ago got me through a rough stretch <laughs> to the degree that you are upset about I think I heard one of our brothers say not too long ago sometimes I just want to see God get them when you're being done wrong right one of the things that helped me calm down and take a step back he's like be careful brothers because uh, depending upon how you treat one another one day God might send you a you <laughs> And if you know the things that are unstated about Jacob's story in this situation, his very name meant what? Somebody can say it. He what? He cheats. <laughs> it's literally what his name meant. 
And so early on, he's getting the birthright by cheating. But he didn't just get the birthright. He gets the birthright and the blessing. And family helped him cheat that second point. But when he wants to go then strike out on his own, because now the consequences of getting it through shady means means you can't stay there at peace with the one who you hustled. Might have felt clever, right? But now you gotta you got to run from the guy who no longer has what was his. And so now he wants to set out and start a family on his own. And so he makes a deal with a man who starts to sound an awful lot like Jacob, a man by the name of Laban, who strikes a deal. Oh, work seven years for my daughter. You like her? Cool. Go ahead, bud. <laughs> right? But on the night of the wedding, he makes a switch. And so now Jacob, see, this is the thing we miss about that portion where Jesus says, with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. He doesn't say in the same amount. If you're starting stuff with people who are innocent, he just says he's going to use the measure you use. You don't get to tell him when to stop. And that's the danger in Jacob's story. See, he got it back with the measure that he used, but he got at least a double portion, right? And so if that ain't a wake-up call for me, one of the things I have to, it's sobering in reading these stories and trying to read them with the depth of understanding that says, God, please keep me off of that path. When I realized that, I started going back. I was like, what did I do to, um, (laughs) was one of the things, if you know folks who go through um, AA and NA, one of the things, one of the steps, if I'm not mistaken, some things you got to make right. It's a part of that's for your sobriety, but sometimes God willing, they're helping you even if they're just a secular organization. They're helping you write your relationship with God. Why? Because the forgiveness is constant. But sometimes the consequences are that measure that we use being poured back on us without, when is this going to stop? Have you ever been there? Okay, I'm the only one. (laughs) And it's so much easier to deal with when is this going to stop when I'm actually functioning with a clean conscience. Oh, but let my conscience start running back through all the stuff I might have done. And please don't let God remind me. Ooh, I can pretend. We talk about every now and again. We're talking with the, the young adults class about the difference between personality and character. I can show you a real good face. But inside, if God is working on me, whoo, that face means nothing. <laughs> And so there are times when we can learn from our friends at uh, the Anonymouses, whether it's the Narcotics Anonymous, the Alcoholics Anonymous. They are a secular organization that has embraced the need. That sometimes we just need to make it right. So God willing, we can start running the clock <laughs> on whatever measurement God is measuring. But don't let that discourage you. Why? Because Jacob's story ended with, with, uh, with Laban and the 14 years? No. He went on to do great things. We won't go into the rest of his story, but understand, one of the reasons why it's also important to arrest those habits that we have or try to stop them is because eventually Jacob ended up compounding his problem because the example that he had set early on in his life before he was ever married might have, might have led to some habits that he had established that we called in the young people's class uh, generational sin. (laughs) And generational sin isn't necessarily this magical thing where God simply is pouring more on you. No, he allows you in the unbroken habits that you are still maintaining to set an example. They say the kids don't always repeat what we say, but they see what we do. And so when we heard the person who said the example of um, those who are setting an example for his son appreciating that, It's because there are times in our lives where the added benefit of stopping those behavior patterns is we do not necessarily know how we are continuing to set an example that is in Jacob's household. How did that play out? See, not only did he have to work extra time, the the, the consequence, just to get the family, once he got the family, he seems to potentially, with the first 10 or so kids, set an example to where they were kind of just as, as shady as he was. How do we know? Because when they took revenge for their sister being violated, how did they do it? They did it through being shady. They struck a deal that they never intended to keep, and they ended up killing a whole bunch of people who had nothing to do with the actual crime. And so now Jacob has to get up and pick up and move again because the kind of example he might have lived out in front of them. He doesn't necessarily have to pay the penalty for it, but he's attached to that situation. And so now he has to continue to deal with the consequences, not only of what he had done to his brother. Now, because he might not have, and this is my might, 
might not have arrested those habits. Now he's having to live out those habits through the, sorry, live out the consequences through the things that he is now suffering in his family. How, how did he end up getting 12 kids? Was it through just the two, two women he married? No. Two women and two concubines. And so that same tendency to do things in kind of a, ah, not so above board way, now that's playing out in the rival wives. And now it's spread out into the servants of the wives. And so now he's having to deal with all of the consequences. And so now I'm continuing like, when does it stop? When does it stop? Now God's like, I've already stopped, bud. This is you. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so God deliver me from the times when I just don't see me doing it to myself. <laughs> and that's what I'm starting to see in these things where he's talking about um, continually see God. Why? Because it's not just like we say, it's not just for head knowledge. There is wisdom that comes with understanding the way that God sees things. The way he, Jesus taught when he got here as God in the flesh. See, we call them parables now, but he was just talking about trees and crops and rain. He was talking about simple things, but he was able to turn them into biblical lessons with deep wisdom. See, play that forward in your life. The more you pick up on God's wisdom, the more you are able to see things in simplicity. How do you think these great businesses are making these? They're, they're reinventing the wheel all over? They're making knockoffs? No. Some of the best money is in innovation. People who look at simple things a completely different way. And they're able to take it and basically turn it into something or an innovation that people haven't seen before. Please apply that to who we are spiritually. And the things that God can, if, he can, if God can allow the world to do that, or even some of his best servants to do that? Can he not do that in our lives? The more we deepen our understanding of who he is, he no longer has to, like we said last week, spell everything out for us. We just begin to look at simple things a different way in ways that can help improve our lives right now if we take the time to basically deepen our understanding of what he has called us to do. So understand how those first um, few verses from 6 to 11, they're talking about the value in understanding God's promise. Why? Because he's going to literally say that at one point in verse 9, his sworn promise, at least in the ESV, but he's also going to talk about it um, indirectly in, in talking about his covenant. Verse 8, he remembers his covenant forever. That word that, I'm sorry, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statue, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. And so his promises matter. And so there are times when, as his child, I need to basically say, if I can't do anything else, I can say I am looking to a father whose promises, God willing, I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to store up some hope in, right? Because I don't see every blessing that I want in my life. And if I'm going to be anything other than miserable, I'm going to have to have a healthy hope life. <laughs> and so if his promises are going to mean anything other than disappointment, I've got to make sure I'm not filling in the blanks for things he's never promised. Because one of the things I can do is I can set myself up for disappointment, telling myself I'm going to get something God never promised me. And so as we've talked about before, some of my peace of mind comes in setting healthy expectations based upon a firm understanding of what he has actually said I should expect. And so half of my peace of mind comes in having a continual desire to understand what it is he's actually told me in the ways of covenants and promises. But then also I get to see his protection if we go on in verses 12 through 15. When they were few in number, of little account, and sojourners in it, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people. He allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, touch not my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. I'm not even going to talk about that in verse 15. I've got a short lesson coming out on the ways that we can sometimes take passages and uh, use them in ways that they, they don't belong. This is a popular one for uh, folks in my profession, preachers who don't want to hear no criticism. <laughs> so sometimes it'll be, touch not God's anointed. And I started, so it wasn't just me. I looked at a whole lot of folks teaching that this week. And they're like, yeah, uh, sometimes as preachers we can slip into the habit of using touch not God's anointed to say, I don't want to hear it. I need to hear it <laughs> because I've told you before, I make mistakes on the regular. And part of me not lingering in a place of wrong is being able to hear it when I'm wrong. 
It's like steering your car. We talked about that example before. I need you to tell me I'm missing the exit before I pass it, God willing, right? And so timing helps, right? And so I want to get God willing. I'll be driving home now. Mom will say something. I'll be like, oh, see, you preached it, but... <laughs> But you want to get in the mindset to where God willing, you see, understand the value, right, in the correction. So that's one of those passages where we can sometimes get stuck. And it's not just that passage. Even if you don't preach, one of the things that life affords us is the opportunity to read these passages through the lens of whatever. Fill in the blank. What do you, what do you want to say, bro? Exactly. <laughs> but it's just that free. Whatever you want it to say, you can make it say that. And that's the danger that we all have. So it goes beyond preaching. Just find your own favorite passage. Oh, judge not lest. I like that one. (laughs) But we got to understand it all in context. That's why continually seeking to understand God beyond the point where I found that verse I really, really love is going to help me have a deeper security in the practical um, challenge of having peace as I'm living this life. And so when he uh, protects them, when he protects them, understand how that relates back to the time of, of Abraham and Isaac, when both of them carried very beautiful women into places where they weren't sure their families were going to be safe. Did they get to see the protection as they were just kind of kind of sitting back? Because that's how I want to see it. See, I don't want to actually have to get into trouble before I see God protecting me. But that's just not how it worked for them. And these are examples that we are given. And so there are times when God is going to call us out into places that seem like they are absolutely frightening. And here's my first response. Kicking and screaming, I'm going the other way to stay safe. (laughs) Right? But I don't get to see the promises if I'm always staying in places where I can keep myself, quote unquote, safe. And that's not the promise he made to these people. And there's a reason why he's using them as an example. They allowed him to carry them into places that were difficult. And that's when they got to see the protection of God. So sometimes we're talking about, man, I just don't see the faith. I don't, I don't feel it. That's me. I've told you that before. I'm probably a world champion doubter. But he uses people who are prone to doubt. Not just once or twice. Doubt was my way of life. Never thought I would step in anybody's pulpit to preach a word because I didn't have that kind of faith. But he's not using people who already have great faith. He uses those people too, right? They can lead the charge where we need faith. But there's some of us just bringing up the rear. We just need to listen to what he's trying to tell us incrementally. Just take one one more. Okay. So that one's shaky, right? Yeah. (laughs) Just take one shaky step forward. And allow him to show you the things that he will show you in the way of protection. Like he showed these men who left their comfort zone and went into places where they couldn't promise they could necessarily keep their families safe. But if it's on our hands, let's just be honest, (laughs) there's only so much we can do. So at certain points, we have to put ourselves in positions where God is going to have to help us understand our protection is beyond. It's beyond what we can do. And so he'll go on to talk about provision. In verses 16 through 24, he's going to talk about the way he provided through Joseph. And then toward the end of the chapter, he's going to talk about the way he provided through Moses in verses 26, really on through almost uh, 43. But beginning in 16 through 24, when he summoned a famine on the land and broke all supply of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with uh, fetters. His neck was put in a collar of Iron until what he um, sorry, sorry until what he had said came to pass the word of the Lord tested him and that's somebody he likes this is a guy who's going to go on to become second in command of Egypt as we have talked about and so there are times like we mentioned where whatever you have been through feet feet hurt in irons neck neck bound in chains see sometimes somebody reminded me this morning I have to use that to to, to sober sober my perspective on my suffering up. I've been through that, right? And so understand how easy it would have been for Joseph to be like, I'm through. (laughs) This is the price for being the one dad could trust. This is the price for by the time uh, Jacob finally gets it together. You see, if you notice in the the generation, um, there there are 10 kids he roughly couldn't trust, but there was some reason. We could say Joseph was just a favorite, but over and over, everywhere Joseph goes, it's not just his dad. The jailer can trust him. Uh, Before that, a slave master can trust him. Everybody can trust Joseph, even Pharaoh. They turn their back on all their stuff and trust it to Joseph. 
and this is the payment for being trustworthy? We said it before. This is a recurring theme in the Bible. In order to understand that God is letting me go through this, he is not, eh. Can you find a word for it? But there's some times where it just feels like he's beating up on me. But it literally says, there are times I'd love to point to Satan and be like, Satan is taking me through this. But no, God is taking me through this for a reason I might not understand. It's something we talk about from time to time. But the point that I saw here that may have, sorry, may have added a little value to the things we've talked about before in that regard was the, the results. Uh, it's a famous part of the story, but the results he got to see after he went through all of that. Verse 20, the king sent and released him. The ruler of the peoples set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. Understand, you might not see it in this life. Cannot promise you health and wealth gospel. If you just wait for this long, you're going to be that guy. No, <laughs> this is be real. There's also the story about um, Abraham, like we said. He had to wait until later to be in, I'm not, not Abraham, um, Lazarus, <laughs> sorry. He had to wait until it was over before he got to finally rest in Abraham's bosom. And I love that picture because you have a man who got to finally see his after all the thankless years in life, comforting a man who seemed to lead a hopeless existence until death, unified in their joy. We, if you don't believe, then we don't need to be here. Because the whole point of this concept of continually is God willing, no matter how invisible it seems. Um, maybe we talk about, talked a little bit about the spectrum. Life gives us spectrums. No matter where God places me on the spectrum of um, not getting to see it until I'm gone or just having to wait a little while longer until I see it here. Uh, as, as long as I can find some way, and this is one of the reasons I say that um, sometimes I, I love preaching because even when I come to an impasse where I don't have a great answer scripturally, sometimes that reminds me, much like when I go through the writer's block, there are some things that God is showing you through your relationship with him, not through the words that somebody's going to be able to tell you. Sometimes the words can just guide you into a place where God is saying, move forward, and I will help you because I made you. I know where you need to be filled up so that you will continue to hope again. And so sometimes the sermon is just pointing you in a direction to draw closer to God. And if you continually seek him and don't give up, eventually, and the reason, why can I say that from example? Because some of the most embarrassed um, <laughs> moments I've ever had in evangelism is handing out goods or socks to people who have no home, who have more faith in God than I do. It's embarrassing to see the degree to which they are still walking around with a greater degree of genuine joy than I've had. And they've got nothing. How does that happen? There's no words I could preach to them on the street corner because God knows where to speak to them. And there's something about them that has led them into a relationship when even on the street corner, they trust even more than I do, Lazarus style. <laughs> that he's taken care of me this many days to provide me at least some shelter and some food, that that preacher who's got a place to stay just still is trying to grow in while wow, grow into, right? And so all I can do is point you into a continual relationship with God where he takes you, unique you, as he made you, and he encourages you in ways that none of us actually can. That's the whole concept of continually. God willing, as we look at what Joseph had to do, what it cost him, and then what we see in the way of what it cost Moses, we will see the value of continuing, sorry, continuing to seek him. Because beyond, like we said, beyond just hearing some names mentioned, those names mean more if we continually seek, for, I forgot to show us the ways in which he can uh, provide us hope in otherwise hopeless circumstances. Verse 26, he sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen, they performed signs among them and miracles in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made the land dark. They did not rebel against his words. He turned their waters into blood and caused their fish to die. Their land swarmed with frogs. He's going to go on all the way through verse 6 to talk about, sorry, 36 to talk about all the things that he did to strike Egypt, to convince Egypt that it's time to let them go. And uh, at the point where they finally decided, okay, 
It's time to let them go, verse 37. Then he brought out Israel with silver and gold, and there was none amongst his tribes who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, for dread of them had fallen upon it. Understand that there are some weights that it sounds cheesy when I say just keep waiting, but to the degree you are going through things where it just seems like it is hopeless, you may end up being shocked at how situations in which you are bound Never in life seemed like anybody would want to show you any favor or let you go. God can arrange situations. What if you have to get out? Come on. <laughs> right? Because there's just some things that I can't do to convince you <laughs> that God can. Because just like he can, he can um, speak to me in ways that encourage me when I'm doing wrong, he can speak to me in ways that can completely turn my heart around in situations where I'm like, I got him. <laughs> in turn, I got him into, you know, you know what? I just, I was looking at this the wrong way. <laughs> And so that is another advantage in continually seeking God. It's whole, the whole concept of let him fight my battles. Um, messing up. Miss Renee got to hear me recording some short lessons this <laughs> week. I'm, I'm trying not to reach into one of those illustrations. Well, but ultimately, what does it look like if as an old guy, I gotta, I gotta go back to fighting. I don't wanna fight anymore, I'm old. Sometimes I get mad enough to wanna fight, but then reality, yeah, I got aches. <laughs> If I could, in this example, <laughs> have Mike Tyson tap me on the shoulder and be like, I got it. Be like, no, Mike, I got this one. Really? No. <laughs> Mike might be, might be old, but I would be within my sense. You, you pick your favorite fighter <laughs> to let them go fight for you. <laughs> God can't, uh, Mike Tyson can't whip God. <laughs> but too often we look past God and his ability to actually help us out of situations it seems impossible. But if we begin to once again believe that he is willing to step up, it helps us when we understand the situations in which he will respond. Because look at this, once again, once again, verse 38. Egypt was glad when they departed, <laughs> for dread of them had fallen upon it. Dread of who? Dread of their former slaves. This was their property. <laughs> they went from telling them what to do to being like, ah, <laughs> because they were so mighty? No. <laughs> Because God, and if he can do that for them, what I'm missing out on, if I don't believe, is the reality that he can do that for me too. And here's a tragedy. I may linger in situations where God simply wanted me to wait to a certain point at which once click, he opened the doors. Did they just go out, close on their back? No. <laughs> they want them to go so bad, they made them rich on the way out. <laughs> And so like I said, I cannot promise you that in this lifetime, but I can say I would be lying if God hadn't delivered me in certain circumstances where this man who had no faith whatsoever, what, I'll say whatsoever, got to see God work in ways where even I had to confess, not only could I not do that, I never foresaw the way in which he would provide me a new opportunity. And so all I can say is this story connects with my life in a way that I can encourage you. Just seek God and let him show you what he can do, even to the degree it seems like you're locked in situations where no one is going to let you out of, no matter how long it's been. But going on in verse 39, verses 39 through 41, he spread a cloud for a covering and a fire to give light by night. They asked and he brought quail. He gave them bread from heaven to abundance. He opened the rock and water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river. For he remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. So understand, chances of God forgetting, I think they're pretty slim. But the bottom line is, he is, at least in some way, setting us an example. That if God remembered that no matter how flawed they might be, because see, that's what happens in chapter 106. See, there are times in life where the thing that is unsaid is God's not giving you a full rundown of my resume. So when I, I mentioned before, giving a resume to get the opportunity here, oh, if you saw the whole life resume of Marcus, that's why you do the background check, right? Exactly. <laughs> because there's more to the resume. That's chapter 106. And so God's being real nice. So the psalmist is being real nice in Psalm 105 because you keep reading and it's the other half of the story. Psalm 105 is God dealing with all their enemies. <laughs> Psalm 106 is God dealing with them. And every one of us has two sides to the resume. And thank God for the time when the thing that's left unsaid 
it's all that stuff that if it got mentioned, like we said, we wouldn't want that on the board. Oh, no. Because <laughs> we all got page two, that, that page two to our resume, right? And so part of the mercy is God giving us a Psalm 105 so that we can um, um, take the opportunity during the times when he's leaving some things unsaid about us to get those things right, right? Which is one of the reasons why I believe at the end of every service, the elders have asked me to give an invitation. Doesn't mean you have to come down here to the front to get your life right. You don't have to come down here to the front to pray to Jesus or pray to God. And Jesus and the Holy Spirit, right? But ultimately, um, we all have to take an opportunity. And why not now? Just like we, you know, on the first day of the week, they came together to break bread. Part of that, I say from time to time, let a person examine themselves. And so part of the invitation is part of the call that we get on the first day of the week to examine ourselves so that God can bring us into places. Like we said, it's not always correction. It's sometimes about giving us a new outlook on uh, the challenges so that we're one, um, clear about the challenges that we really have, but in his promises, we're not filling in the blank, like we said before, with things he never intended for us. So that in uh, whatever season we're in, we say it from time to time, one of my, maybe this will become one of my new dead horse verses, is uh, godliness, with, godliness with contentment. So that in whatever circumstance he brings us, like Paul mentioned, I have learned whether I have a little or a lot to be content. And so my prayer for me, we'll say, is my prayer for you as we um, see this time of invitation. May God guide us to continually seek his presence in a way that will make us more content regardless what challenges the enemy brings our way as we together stand and sing. What can wash away 